Just the hill that I live on is steep And the road's full of ruts And the people who live in the flat land Think we folks are nuts Unfortunately, not all backcountry roads are such a pleasure to drive. Hi, this is Red O'Farrell. I am Terry Jo Barber, a hydrologist in Mendocino County, and this is Claire. We are three generations of road restorationists. This video was prepared to illustrate the techniques described in the Forest and Ranch Roads Handbook. We focus on the chapters of drainage and road reconstruction as a means of keeping excessive sediment pollution out of streams. You will see film footage of on-the-ground road drainage problems and reconstruction so that you may use these scenes as you reconstruct your own roads in the future. Many thanks are due to the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection and California Department of Fish and Game for funding this project and to the Mendocino County Resource Conservation District for their vision in creating such a video. Our video is organized into four parts. Part 1, the introduction. Part 2, common elements to all road upgrading projects. Part 3, construction techniques including applications for road surface drainage and stream crossings. And Part 4, a review of the most important points of the video. The effects of roads both on the landscape and on downstream water quality has grown to be one of the most widespread nemesis of salmon in the Pacific Northwest. The goals of this video production and the accompanying Forest and Ranch Roads Handbook are to assist landowners in making roads safer and more reliable in all kinds of weather, maintaining downstream water quality by avoiding excessive erosion caused by the road, reducing road maintenance costs, avoiding litigation as a result of excessive erosion such as violations of the Clean Water Act or property damage to downhill or downstream neighbors, and low impact and low cost in the future. Ridges, hill slopes, and valleys, the natural topography, have drained watersheds of runoff to streams in ways that fishes and other aquatic life has evolved with. Before roads entered the picture, natural watercourses not only transported water but also passed gravel, logs, and branches. These same streams have also provided fish with habitat during their various life stages and avenues for migration to and from the ocean. Geologists Danny Hagens and Dr. Bill Weaver founded the methods we are presenting here in this video and have employed them successfully to the benefit of landowners and fish who appreciate dependable roads and clean water. Their ideas were spawned in Redwood National Park back in the 1970s where they worked as part of a team researching the effects of roads across the landscapes of the Redwood Creek watershed. Their work spans 35 years in watershed restoration on public and private ranches and forest lands. In 2001, Danny Hagens won the Salmonid Restoration Federation's Restorationist of the Year Award for his commitment, dedication, and cost-effective work restoring salmon watersheds throughout the Pacific Northwest. Roads are new features on the landscape all over watersheds. They have altered the natural drainage networks that evolved over eons. Dr. Bill Weaver of Pacific Watershed Associates explains. I guess perhaps the most interesting thing for me about roads is that there's nothing in nature like a road in the hill. So when we cut across the landscape with road systems, uh, this one being in Rocky Mountain National Park just serves as a good example, um, it shows that uh, that we've essentially cut across all those uh, energy paths and all those material paths that uh, tend to operate in nature. And so uh, unless we are very diligent about making sure that, that water that is uh, originating from above the road is transported directly across the road uh, and straight on down the hillside, then we will have interrupted that hydrologic regime on the hill slope in terms of collecting and concentrating the water along the road and discharging it at discrete locations which ends up with gullying and other mass wasting events. Um, and also in constructing a road like this where we're taking a gouge out of the hillside, we've undercut the hill slopes above us and we've added material to the hill slopes below us and over steepened them so you increase the opportunity for mass wasting on fill slope areas like this and for cuts like this to result in mass wasting from uh, above the road. Surface erosion involves uh, sheet erosion or the disaggregation of particles from raindrop impact. 
and the movement in those particles in small channels up to what they call rills. So rill and surface erosion would be lumped together. Once the rills combine into channels that are more than about a square foot in cross section, so a foot wide and a foot deep, then they're arbitrarily called gullies. So there's a kind of a gradation between when you go from surface erosion to rills to gullies, gullies being anything larger than about a square foot in cross section. Gullies are really newly formed channels where you've collected and concentrated water, diverted it across the hillside or across bare soil area or across a grassland or even in a forested environment. It's essentially a newly developing stream channel. If you don't remove the water from it, it's going to continue to evolve until it develops a quasi-stable uh, cross-sectional dimension, a length and width associated with a newly developing stream channel. Channel erosion is constituted either from downcutting of the bed or bank erosion, which uh, tends to either widen or cause the channel to move uh, back and forth across the landscape. And then mass erosion and any type of mass failure, landslide erosion in other words, uh, would be in this category. And associated with road systems, we'll see it uh, real commonly cut bank failures that land on the road surface or fill slope failures that tend to move down the hillside and may or may not get into a stream channel. I think the important point to identify here is that the four basic processes are really the only processes that you really have to worry about. If you understand those processes and you can either control or prevent them from occurring, then you're going to be the bulk of the way towards trying to prevent sediment from being delivered to stream channels. A road builder can build a road so that it disrupts the natural water flow as has too often been the case, or so that it incorporates the natural drainage system and moves the water off the road as quickly as possible. Those roads that disrupt the natural course of water are far more erosion prone, cause road safety concerns, and cause problems for aquatic life using the affected stream. So there are some places that roads literally shouldn't be built. It'd be extremely difficult for you to do anything cost effectively or even effectively to prevent the continued influence of that road on the stream system. Yet we all use roads. They take us to work, to our ranches, vineyards and forests. And most importantly, they take us home. And now we have a video glossary of terms which we will use throughout this video. Road bed, cut slope, fill slope, inboard ditch, outboard berm, base of fill, cut portion of road, fill portion of road, ditch relief culvert, stream crossing, hinge line, axis of the stream, stream diversion, stream diversion gully, stream crossing fill, road fill. Be on the lookout for warning signs along these roads that indicate present or future problems. discharge of ditch relief culverts at a frequency which is far too wide or too great for the amount of runoff that's being generated from the road surface. The treatment is to go back up the road and put in a number of different ditch relief culverts or rolling dips or outslope the road, a variety of different treatments you can use to disperse the water so that it no longer collects and concentrates and discharges at a single location. Everything from the road up here that is discharged into the ditch and carried through the ditch relief culvert is actually deposited in the stream itself. And you can see just by uh, driving on the road with a little bit of runoff having occurred recently, you can see that there's a lot of turbidity in the water producing a lot of fine sediment and delivering it down below. If you go there in the summer and you see this, what really happened here is you're freezing the ditch at a point in time and you're looking at a conveyor belt that essentially stopped moving. And as soon as the runoff hits, then all this stuff starts mobilizing again and continues to pass on down. And this goes into a small stream channel. Berms on the outboard edge of the road inhibit surface drainage. When a berm is breached, water accumulated on the road is released all at once, exceeding the soil's natural resistance to erosion. Often, the breached berm erodes a gully down the receiving hill slope, 
By eliminating the berm, water is free to drain from the road in a uniform, low-energy fashion readily absorbed by the soil. Now, let's look at problems roads cause when they encounter streams. Small streams are often unintentionally blocked by road fill. This diverted stream flow may not find its path across the road and back into the same stream. Rather, it proceeds directly downhill, eroding gullies into the road and hill slopes, wasting topsoil, and delivering dirt and mud to the receiving stream. This is an example of a road system here that we mapped. This is in the Copper Creek drainage again in Redwood Creek. Uh, the stream crossings have been labeled with a high diversion potential or a no diversion potential. If this culvert plugs, the water diverts and goes down the road. This one right here, if it plugs, it just washes out the crossing and you can see it's partially washed out already. This one has a high diversion potential and the culvert plugged. You can see the little flat thing across the inlet of the culvert. The water came down the road here and then over the edge at, at a landing, right close to a landing and down the hillside. It produced a huge gully coming down the hillside here and then when that water with all its sediment in it reached the natural stream channel, then it gullied the natural stream channel also. If you have big scallops or even small scallops on the outside edge of your road, good indication there's been water flowing over the road at some time. Or where you have culvert inlets here, where you have terraces on both sides of the culvert, suggesting that water has been standing there at some time in the past, and uh, you had a fan of material deposited around or next to the culvert inlet, and then when the water went down, it trenched through that material. So you look for these uh, terraces on one or both sides of the stream crossing, uh, culvert usually at the, at the elevation of the top of the culvert or even higher than the top of the culvert. That suggests that the culvert was either plugged at some time in the past or its capacity was exceeded and you had standing water there. Sometime the inlets of the culvert on the other side of the road plugged and, uh, and you got a lot of water and sediment accumulated there and they said, well, rather than dig it out and try to reopen, we'll just put in two new culverts higher in the fill. When your stream channel comes down at a very steep gradient, maybe 20, 25 percent, and your culvert set in at a shallow gradient, maybe 5 percent, then that change in grade or change in uh, break in slope right there tends to accumulate material at the inlet of the culvert. Both organic debris tends to, tends to fall out and certainly sediment tends to fall out right at the culvert inlet where that change in grade is, change in grade and change in velocity. And then at the outlet end, then you've got a big drop here to get into the stream channel. If you don't put some kind of uh, downspout on it to carry it, then you're going to lose a lot of material at this location. We'd like to see culverts in a natural stream grade on the bed of the stream channel itself. In this case, a, an obstacle here, you can see the, the stream comes in at an angle like this and then has to make a, uh, a turn before it goes into the culvert. So any organic debris that's floating down parallel to the stream tends to overshoot and then swing into the culvert inlet. So that's one of the problems with having culverts that aren't, aren't aligned directly with your stream, uh, stream channel is they tend to be, have a higher plugging potential. Even a, something like this in front of the culvert inlet creating a lot of turbulence can reduce the capacity of the culvert by up to 20 percent even, even though it doesn't plug the culvert. It, it lowers the efficiency with which that culvert can actually transmit water. You can see this is a washed out stream crossing right here on a uh, forest road. Uh, this was the year after they built the stream crossing. They came in and they put what they call a trash rack or a trash barrier over the inlet of the culvert, uh, which consists of two by four constructed box to screen out organic debris. Unfortunately, while the culvert has a 36 inch diameter, the grates between the, between the, uh, the pieces on the box are only about eight inches apart. So you've effectively increased the plugging potential of this culvert dramatically by reducing the effective opening of the culvert from 36 inches down to about 12 inches or 8 inches. So you want to go in with some kind of uh, debris barrier upstream from the culvert inlet here, which filters material out before it gets to the inlet, and leave the inlet open. Culverts should be capable of transporting and passing both water, sediment, and organic debris of a certain size. Note the high rate of speed water is passing through this culvert. If you reduce the natural cross-sectional area of the stream, water responds by moving more quickly through the smaller space. You cannot expect a fish to swim against this type of current. Now we get to mass wasting. And there's a couple of kinds of mass wasting or landslide processes associated with roads that you really want to look at closely. One is uh, cut bank failures, and the other one are fill slope failures. When you're dealing with uh, road systems, the type of uh, road failures that you have some ability to control are typically the ones uh, where you see scarps and cracks paralleling the road. 
When they parallel the road on the outer half of the road, it's, al it's almost always an indication of fill slope problems. Fill slope related instability, uh, lack of compaction, and, uh, and potential uh, failure of the material on the outside edge of the road. These are pretty easy to map and to, uh, and to identify and then to simply remove the material. Now, what you'd really want to do in a setting like this, if you found this kind of situation in the field, <clears throat> would be to walk down to the base of the fill slope and even beyond that to identify where the nearest stream was. If this is going to fail and simply feather out on the slope and your stream's a thousand feet away, then there'd be no reason to treat this. That'd be, that'd be money that'd be poorly spent because even if this fails, it wouldn't be delivered to a stream channel. This is a pretty good example because this is a real active cut bank. And you'd say, looking at this, so we ought to really do something here because this looked really bad. The emphasis for me is anyway is looks because what you really want to decide is whether any of this material is actually being delivered to a stream channel or could be delivered to a stream channel. In most cases, for most small single and double lane forest roads and ranch roads, these type of cut bank failures end up usually on the road bed. You know, 95% of the cases the road collects and concentrates all that material. And almost what's more important than the failure of this material landing on the road is what you do with that material when you clean it off the road. Do you uh, simply dump it over the outside edge and create fill slope failures that then go down into the stream? Or do you haul it off and, and put it on a stable oil disposal site somewhere off site? Common elements to all road upgrading projects. The goal is to make the road invisible to the watershed's drainage pattern. We can improve the roads we have today so that they have a lower risk of failure during large storms and drain with minimal erosion at predetermined points. The type of repair or upgrade and road surface you select should be chosen in the context of how you use the road. Consider the season the road is to be used in. Dry season roads are ideal for armored ford stream crossings and outsloped road surfaces with rolling dips. We suggest surveying your road to select reconstruction techniques based on your individual site conditions and type of use expected on your road. Get hold of some ribbon flagging and a permanent marker and write out your ideas on a flag and tie it on site next to the problem you want to fix. Build a map from an air photo or topographic map. This will help you keep track of your ideas and even more importantly, ensure that the equipment operator knows what you want to do and where. We advise getting your plan checked by an experienced, qualified professional to ensure your plan minimizes sediment delivery to streams. This advice can be obtained for free at the Natural Resource Conservation Service or you can contact a paid consultant or licensed contractor. Here is a list of the types of permits you will require before you begin construction. Plan on these requiring up to one full year to complete from start to finish. And now we have Danny Hagens of Pacific Watershed Associates who will explain the technical elements of road reconstruction. If streams are flowing at the time of the proposed work, then you will need to dewater the stream channel through the excavation area. Temporary straw bill, silt fence, or sandbag dams must be constructed both upstream and downstream of the work area. At the upper dam, flow should be pumped or gravity fed around the excavated area and back into the same channel. Below the excavation, the lower dam must capture any sediment loss during the excavation and prevent downstream clouding of the water. If fish are present, you must contact a fish and game biologist to capture and move the fish prior to drying up the reach of stream where construction is to occur. Whether you are changing road drainage or installing stream crossing, one must plan for the need to water the work area to provide for good soil compaction and to reduce dust problems. Watering can be done manually with hoses if the work area is confined, such as at a stream crossing or a specific rolling dip or with water trucks along long segments of road reaches. Reconstructing stream crossings or excavating potential landslides can often generate excess spoil material. You must have a plan for disposing of spoil where it has no chance of entering a stream channel. Excess spoil is generally more stable and poses a lower risk of causing problems when it is stored along the inside versus the outside of the road. Excess spoil can either be stored locally near the work site 
or it can be inhauled in dump trucks to a stable location such as a stable broad ridge or be used to fill dry inboard ditches where road outsloping is planned. Always avoid side casting excess spoil beyond the outside edge of the road on very steep slopes or in close proximity to stream channels. There is usually a high risk of this practice delivering sediment to stream channels or triggering hill slope failures. The practice of just side casting spoil material wherever you are along the road may attract more attention than you want. Once your project is complete, we recommend treating all disturbed soils with a combination of native seed and weed-free straw mulch. This will protect the soil surface from erosion during the coming winter. Part 3, construction, is divided into three parts. First, surface drainage through shaping the road surface, and then surface drainage through drainage structures, and then stream crossing repair and upgrades. You might wonder how to minimize the loss of material on the top of the road. A surprising depth of soil is lost from road surfaces every year. Where does this material go? Unfortunately, lots of it ends up clouding up rivers and streams. In this section, we will try to convey the different strategies used for surface water road drainage to minimize this surface erosion, what these strategies look like, and provide insight as to how to fit these techniques into your own individual situation. There are two ways to drain the road surface, through shaping the road surface and by incorporating drainage structures. Here we go over the tools of insloping, outsloping, and crowning to shape road surfaces for runoff drainage. The type of road shape chosen for your road should vary along the length of the road based on the presence or absence of springs and emergent groundwater and based on safety concerns. We discourage landowners from applying a single road shape approach to fit all conditions along the lengths of their roads. The following examples illustrate the conversion of insloped and flat roadbeds with inboard ditches and large berms to outsloped roads with no inboard ditches and little to no berm. Outsloped to flat road shapes work very well in conjunction with properly spaced rolling dips. We encourage the use of outsloped roads with or without an inboard ditch. If cut banks lack seepage most or all of the year, as in these photos, then there is no fundamental reason to have an inboard ditch. Burying the inboard ditch and removing the berm will add road width to the running surface, eliminate the need for and maintenance of ditch relief culverts, and provide for dispersed runoff off the roadbed. All these things combine to prevent sediment delivery to stream channels and protect fish habitat, as well as lower long-term road maintenance costs for the landowners. Outsloping and rolling dips have been blamed for an uncomfortably rough ride. Imagine you are behind the wheel. This vehicle is traveling faster than I would go. Nevertheless, it's a smooth ride, don't you think? The following three examples illustrate the basic construction steps to converting roads to outsloped road shapes. The first example is utilizing a backhoe to excavate the berm and the fill along the outside edge of the road and place the material directly in the inboard ditch. The next step has the backhoe distributing the fill along the ditch and the inner half of the road. This is followed by the grader doing the final road shaping by continuing to move material from the outer half of the road to the inner half. The grader operator must be knowledgeable about driving safety concerns and know when and where along the road to vary the road pitch. During the final grading, a water truck should be present to apply water to ensure good compaction. Let's view the same stretch of road nearly two years after the initial reshaping of the road. The road has year-round use and has not been graded since reconstruction, yet the road still displays a nice outsloped road shape and remains very effective at dispersing road runoff. The second example utilizes a hydraulic excavator to pull the berm and the fill along the outside edge of the road. Note how the excavator is separating large vegetation and placing it aside so as to place clean fill along the base of the cut bank. The dozer follows the excavator and is distributing the material along the inner half of the road with an outsloped shape. 
This is in turn followed by the grader defining the final road shape. The after reconstruction photos illustrate a mild 2 to 3 percent outslope of the roadbed with no ditch or berm and periodic rolling dips. The final example utilizes in hauled spoil material to achieve an outsloped road shape. Excess spoil from stream crossing or landslide excavations, assuming it is suitable material, can be trucked to dry ditch reaches of road and used to fill the ditch. The dozer can then redistribute the materials along the inner half of the road with a mild outslope. As in the other examples, the grader can perform final road shaping by continuing to lower the outer half of the road and move all material toward the inner half of the road. Let's review a few before and after examples of roads being converted from non-fish friendly, in-sloped, burned, and eroding ditch shapes to outsloped and dispersed drainage road shapes. Remember to carefully evaluate the seepage regime along the cut bank to determine whether your road should be outsloped with or without an inboard ditch. If there is a lot of seasonal seepage and spring flow from the cut bank, then an inboard ditch with frequent ditch relief culverts must be retained to ensure roadbed strength. However, the roadbed can still be outsloped with rolling dips in order to quickly shed roadbed derived runoff and sediment off of the outside edge of the road in a dispersed manner. Preventing wet ditches from receiving roadbed derived sediment will minimize the need to regrade the inboard ditch. Safety concerns dictate where and to what degree a road can be outsloped. On straight reaches of road, roads are commonly outsloped with a 2 to 4 percent gradient depending on the road steepness. On the outside of bends in the road, where there is a hazard of sliding off the road, the road is usually constructed as a flat road until you are out of the bend into a straight reach of road where you can increase the outslope again. On the inside of bends, where your momentum will slide you into the cut bank, and not off the outside edge of the road. You can construct a super outslope up to 6% in order to ensure all road runoff leaves the road on the bend. Through cut roads are roads with cut banks on both sides of the road that cannot be drained easily, if at all. They are a result of poor road design and location. If the through cut is less than two feet high on one side of the road, it may be possible to excavate long berm breaches through the hillside in order to provide for dispersed road drainage. The approach should be to regrade the roadbed with a three to six percent outslope to get all road runoff to one side of the road, and then excavate long berm breaches that are constructed at a grade that is two to four percent steeper than the road that drains to the berm breach. If the berm breach is gentler than the road grade draining to it, it will not function through the winter because you will be encouraging deposition of sediment at the head of the berm breach and soon winter runoff will be flowing down the road again. If through cut sections of roads are very deep and long, another option to prevent or minimize road related sediment delivery to nearby streams is to construct settling basins at the outlet of the through cut if site conditions permit. The basin should be large enough to collect and store sediment originating from the road and ditch in the through cut and have at least a three foot wide by one foot deep U-shaped rock spillway to direct runoff to a stable hill slope location. Road drainage structures. The California Forest Practice Rules suggest a minimum acceptable distance between road drainage structures as has California Department of Fish and Game's Salmonid Habitat Restoration Manual. Please look to one of these or our Forest and Ranch Roads Handbook for guidance on frequency and spacing of road drainage structures. Rolling dips are an excellent way to drain year-round use roads. They can be used to drain road runoff and sediment off the outside edge of the road at a predetermined spacing. They can drain just the road surface or can be constructed to drain both the road and the adjacent ditch. The use of rolling dips have received much criticism over the years, largely because they have been constructed too short and abrupt, as in this example. A well-constructed rolling dip provides both drivability for the intended vehicle use, as well as permanent year-round dispersed drainage. We view rolling dips as permanent road drainage structures equivalent to the placement of culverts along the road. 
depending on the spacing between rolling dips or ditch relief culverts, you are defining a known watershed area in square feet, which will drain road runoff to and through the drainage structure. Depending on the erodibility of the soils, the spacing between individual rolling dips dictates to what degree you will experience erosion on or downslope of the roadbed. It is important to remember that we cannot stop all erosion along our roads. However, depending on how we shape or drain our roads, we can dictate whether the erosional products from the road are delivered to stream channels in our watershed or are they dispersed on the hill slopes below the road. The diagram shows the components of a well-constructed rolling dip. Depending on the steepness of the road, rolling dips should have a 30 to 80 foot long approach where we are slightly steepening the road grade. A broad U-shaped axis or low point in the road and a 15 to 35 foot section of road which rises with a distinct positive or reverse grade to ensure all road runoff and sediment leaves the road through the axis of the dip. The road approach and dip axis should have a mild 2 to 4 percent outslope all the way to the outside edge of the road. This ensures all sediment exits the road bed and is transported to the hill slope below the road. Rolling dips are best constructed with either a dozer or a grader. If you are eliminating the inboard ditch, the dozer grader roughs in the rolling dip by moving most all of the excavated roadbed material to the inner half of the road. If one is retaining the ditch, then the material can be used to enhance the reverse grade portion of the rolling dip and provide material for a gradual transition back to the original road grade. Dozers with angle blades or U-blades are best for controlling the distribution of material. The anticipated use level of the road frequently determines whether you should apply water and use compactors to firm up the roadbed immediately. The following illustrate before, during, and after examples of road drainage patterns with and without rolling dips. Keep in mind that no two rolling dips have to be constructed exactly the same way. The final form of each rolling dip is dictated by several factors including the curvature of the road, the steepness of the adjacent hill slope, the steepness of the road, the intended use levels, and the type of vehicles which use the road. Also remember that rolling dips should nearly always be constructed in straight reaches of road and have a long approach and broad belly shape through the axis of the dip so as to provide for good drivability. And then also have true positive or reverse grade so as to always have permanent drainage. And finally, in most situations, rolling dips should be limited to road grades less than 12 to 14 percent. We prefer rolling dips to culverts or water bars due to dips being less expensive than a culvert, more permanent than a water bar, and requiring less maintenance than either. Pick from these based on whether your road use is year-round or seasonal. Remember we want to avoid the use of a ditch if at all possible because ditches prolong the time your road retains water and they also unnaturally concentrate water requiring its outlet at some point which may cause a gully. The second type of road drainage structures we will discuss are ditch relief culverts. Ditch relief culverts should be installed at approximately a 30 degree angle to the road and ditch. Ditch beyond the inlet should be plugged with material to ensure flow enters the culvert. Culvert outlet should preferably be at the base of the fill slope so water discharges onto the native hill slope and not onto the fill material. Placing your ditch relief culverts at a steep angle will allow them to be self-cleaning and require less maintenance. In situations where there is abundant shrub and woody vegetation along the road, we recommend the minimum size of culvert be an 18 inch culvert to reduce the plugging potential. When the outlet of a ditch relief culvert discharges onto the fill, then down spouts or rock armor should be placed on the fill to prevent erosion and convey the flow to the base of the fill. If cut banks are prone to high ravel rates, then drop inlets and wooden caps can be placed over the inlet to reduce the plugging potential and subsequent maintenance. If soils are dry, then watering the fill material as the culvert is buried is recommended in order to get good compaction. You should be prepared to work around buried phone and power lines 
when installing ditch relief culverts. We will now discuss stream crossing drainage structures. A stream is defined as a low spot in the landscape with a definable bed and bank and which shows past evidence of sediment transport. There are five ways roads cross over stream channels. They are with bridges, either log, flat car, or manufactured, arch culverts or called bottomless culverts, which allow for a natural stream bed, culverts, either round or oval, rock armored fill crossings, which have no culvert but rely on the size of the rock armor to prevent erosion of the underlying fill, and wet or ford crossings where no fill material is present on the stream bed. Bridges are the best drainage structure to cross over fish bearing or large year-round streams. County and fire protection standards frequently will dictate the acceptable width or weight requirements for most bridges. Important design considerations landowners must take into account in constructing a stable bridge crossing include designing the bridge high enough to pass all sizes of large wood and debris which would be in transport during the 100 year storm. To protect the bridge abutments, avoid constricting the channel width under the bridge. Reducing the channel cross-sectional area under the bridge can often lead to bed and bank erosion around the bridge abutments which in turn can lead to very costly repairs. Avoid descending road approaches leading down to the bridge. This will allow long lengths of road to drain sediment and muddy water directly to the stream. Where possible, design the bridge elevation to be higher than the road approaches in order to shed road runoff and fine sediment onto the hill slopes just prior to the bridge crossing. Along many forest and ranch roads, old bridges were constructed as log stringer bridges with some amount of fill placed over the logs. In order to remove and install new, well-designed bridges, one must first carefully remove the fill material over the logs and then winch out the old growth logs. Any perched fill on the crossing approaches must also be excavated at the same time. As mentioned earlier, most bridge projects require, at a minimum, a fish and game 1600 permit, a need for dewatering the stream reach, temporary dams to prevent downstream sedimentation, and fish rescue operations. Once the new abutments have been installed, you will be ready to place the manufactured bridge in place. In this example, an undersized culverted stream crossing is being replaced with a flat car bridge crossing. The excavator begins a conversion by first excavating and inhauling perch side cast fill from the approaches to the stream crossing. The culvert, stream crossing fill, and upstream channel stored sediment is then excavated and also trucked to a stable spoil location. Heavy equipment then unloads the arriving flat car from the flatbed truck and the bridge is placed on riprap abutments. Well constructed bridge crossings, irregardless of the type, should always have large openings under the bridge to pass future large wood in transport and provide for both upstream and downstream fish passage year around. Culverts are most commonly used when roads cross over streams. Culverted stream crossings are nothing more than an earthen dam with a hole or culvert through the dam. For the culvert to be at the lowest risk of plugging and failure, Stream crossing culverts should be designed to accommodate and pass the 100 year storm discharge as well as sediment and transport and some portion of the wood and debris which would also be in transport. We recommend culverts be installed at the base of the fill on the natural stream bed. Culverts should be installed in line with the upstream and downstream natural channel so as to mimic the natural wood and sediment transport regime as much as is possible. We are frequently asked about the use of plastic pipe at stream crossings. We recommend installing double wall plastic pipe at stream crossings which need 30 inch or smaller diameters. For streams which require 36 inch or larger culverts to accommodate the 100 year storm, we recommend 12 or 14 gauge corrugated metal pipe, commonly referred to as CMP. Let's look at several examples of replacing old, poorly installed, and undersized culverts along forest and rural subdivision roads. 
In many of these rural subdivisions, we are finally converting these former logging roads into rural roads. Note how high in the fill many of the culverts were installed in the past, how much outlet erosion has occurred in the past, and how much sediment has been stored above the culvert inlets. Once reconstructed, the new culverts are sized for the 100-year storm, placed at the base of the fill and in line with the natural channel, and we have purchased sufficient lengths of culvert to build stable fill slopes, nearly 50% in steepness, on the downstream side of the road. The fill slopes must be reconstructed at a steeper angle than 50%, then coarse riprap can be used to buttress and support the downstream fill slopes. The following examples illustrate many of the steps an experienced equipment operator must go through to properly reconstruct stream crossings with a low risk of failure. This large stream crossing has a culvert set very high in the fill. The hydraulic excavator begins by digging the fill and passing material to the dozer operator, who is temporarily getting the material far enough away from the crossing to provide for an open workspace. Next, the excavator is redefining and daylighting the buried natural channel above the former culvert inlet. Note the recently unearthed stumps. Much of this material is excess spoil which is being stored locally up an old skid trail by the dozer operator. As culverts are delivered to the project area, they must be unloaded by the excavator and distributed to the designated work sites. Up to a culvert diameter of 48 inches, it is often a good idea to assemble up to two or three lengths of 20-foot culvert on the flat road for ease of connecting the pipe together. Once the stream crossing fill excavation is completed down to the natural stream bed, the culvert can be carried to and placed into position. On deep fill crossings, where large volumes of fill will be backfilled over the culvert, it is recommended the new culvert be installed with a slight convex camber in order to accommodate some settlement over time beneath the new culvert. Proper compaction is essential around the culvert in order to prevent any seepage through the fill adjacent to new culvert in shallow lifts of six inches or so. Watering the fills as the backfilling and final grading occurs will also greatly assist in getting good compaction and reconstructing a stable fill crossing. Note the grader operator's attention to detail as he constructs a low berm along the outside edge of the road. This is important to protect the newly constructed fill from receiving runoff and potential erosion during the first fall rainstorms. All bare soil areas where there is any risk of surface erosion and sediment delivery to the stream are grass seeded at a rate of 50 pounds per acre and straw mulched at a rate of 3,000 pounds per acre that is, so very little bare ground is visible. The post-winter photos of the site show minimal erosion of the newly constructed fill, good revegetation, and a well-designed and installed low-risk of failure stream crossing. The second example illustrates culvert installations to provide for year-round fish passage at a stream crossing. The original culvert at the crossing is undersized for the 100-year stream flow, has its outlet high in the fill preventing juvenile fish passage and the inlet shows evidence of past erosion and a high plugging potential with wood due to the small culvert size. The excavator operator begins by excavating the fill around the old culvert. Assistance is often valuable in constructing a smooth flat bed when greater than 48 inch diameter culverts are being installed at stream crossings. A smooth bed beneath the culvert will greatly facilitate bolting large diameter culverts together. Once the culvert sections are fastened together, the backfilling over the new culvert begins. The excavator bucket, coupled with applying water to the fill, can ensure a good seal around the culvert and provide for good compaction. The post-construction photos show a culvert placed into the stream bed approximately 10% of the diameter at the outlet, with a flared inlet to minimize the plugging potential. Following the winter, the inside of the culvert exhibits a gravel bed during low flow conditions, providing fish passage both up and downstream. Recent guidelines from the National Marine Fisheries Service 
and the Cal Department of Fish and Game suggest culverts placed in fish streams be positioned with 25% of the culvert diameter beneath the natural stream bed elevation. The third example illustrates converting former logging road Humboldt log crossings to rural subdivision culverted stream crossings on non-fish bearing streams. The excavator begins by removing fill and debris downstream from the outlet of the culvert. If the wood is not completely removed, then the likelihood of constructing a stable stream crossing is doubtful since the wood will continue to decay and pose a risk of capturing winter stream flow as sinkholes and collapsed structures form through the crossing. Once all the wood and fill is excavated, the smooth bed at the natural channel grade is created and the new culvert sized for the 100 year storm is positioned. The dozer operator often will provide material to the excavator operator. Another very good tool for compacting fills is to use hydraulic sheep's foot compactors. With quick release attachments on the excavator, the operator can quickly switch from the bucket to the sheep's foot compactor. Once the backfilling is complete and the downstream fill face has also been compacted, final watering and grading of the road shape can take place. Note the greater berm at the outside edge of the road protecting the new long fill slope from runoff during the first winter rains. The after construction photos show the new culvert outlet near the base of the fill. The following dill photographs show additional examples of approaches to stormproofing stream crossings. The before photo is a view looking downstream at the culvert inlet about 40 feet in the distance. In the next photo, the old culvert has been removed and the new culvert has been installed at the base of the fill in the natural channel. The landowners in this rural subdivision did not want critical dips to prevent stream diversions along their roads. So the excavator operator is excavating a trench for an overflow culvert set higher in the fill in order to minimize the risk of stream diversions in the event the lower culvert plugs. Once the overflow pipe was installed, a flared inlet was installed on the lower culvert to further reduce the potential for plugging with debris and sediment. As mentioned earlier, a critical rolling dip prevents stream flow from diverting down the road, resulting in potentially large volumes of gully and landslide erosion. A critical dip is constructed similarly to a rolling dip and is expressed by a distinct road grade reversal along the down road hinge line of the stream crossing. As can be seen in this series of critical dips, each can be constructed slightly different but the intent is to get stream flow back into the same stream channel as quickly as possible while also minimizing the extent of the future erosion and still maintain the highest degree of drivability over the stream crossing. During large storms, culvert failure is frequently triggered by the loss of culvert capacity due to the accumulation of wood and sediment at the inlet. To reduce the risk of properly sized culverts plugging with sediment and debris, flared inlets and or single post trash racks can be installed or placed at the culvert inlet. Flared inlets increase the capacity of the culvert to pass water by about 20 percent. We believe the greatest value of flared inlets is how they will either spin wood around which is in transport and allow it to pass through the culvert or trap the wood slightly upstream from the culvert inlet on the apron to prevent the complete plugging of the inlet. Another method to reduce culvert plugging and failure is to install a single post trash rack in front of and centered on the culvert inlet. If you are installing a 36 inch culvert then the trash rack should be pounded securely into the stream bed 36 inches above the culvert inlet. The post should be anchored well enough into the stream bed to capture, in a triangular pattern, any and all large wood which may come down the channel in a large storm. The goal is to keep the inlet open and flowing through the storm, at which time you can get out and remove the debris and reestablish full capacity at the culvert inlet. At streams exhibiting very high rates of sediment transport leading to the culvert inlet, it may be advantageous to install a slotted drop inlet or riser 
on the inlet of the culvert. The slots allow most sediment to be captured in the basin around the inlet while still permitting stream flow to drain through the culvert. If for some reason recently installed culverts do not drain directly to the base of the fill, then downspouts and rock armor protection should be placed at the culvert outlet. If half round downspouts are used to convey stream flow to the base of the fill, then they should be six inches larger in diameter than the culvert under the road. Downspouts should be securely staked or anchored to the fill so that no flexing occurs and that downspouts do not spill water onto the fill slope. We encourage the use of full round downspouts to avoid any possibility of spilling water and eroding the fill slope. Rock armor can be used in place of downspouts to protect the fill from erosion. However, it is crucial that the rock is sized properly to resist transport by the peak culvert flow, the rock extends to the base of the fill, and the rock armor has a channel width and depth to contain the expected peak flow from the culvert outlet. Finally, let's discuss the use of rock armored fill crossings. Armored crossings have no culverts through the fill, but rely on protecting the underlying fill material with coarse rock armor. We think the use of armored fill crossings are very appropriate for either small, steep gradient streams where culverts will have a high risk of plugging and or on seasonal use roads where you are desiring to minimize road maintenance costs. This is road runoff that's gulling the fill crossing. This is the tributary coming down that's been slowly removing the crossing here. So we've dipped the road significantly with a big broad dip as we went through that crossing stream orientations right here. We've dug a keyway down here at the base of the fill, pretty deep keyway, a foot, foot and a half, two feet deep. We've laid filter fabric up and over the fill slope here, the remaining fill slope, and then into about the midpoint of the road. And now we're in the process of importing coarse rock armor. So the key to this is if you think your, your peak flood flow for your small stream is, let's say, five foot flow, then we are probably armoring 25 feet out here because you want to accommodate alluvial fans forming on the road such that no matter how they form, you've dipped the road sufficiently to allow that water to always flow back over our rock armor and therefore we protect the crossing. In this second example, a front end loader is delivering rock to the crossing site where the excavator is placing the rock on the downstream fill face. The larger diameter rock is usually placed near the base of the fill. The rock armor should be at least two rock diameters deep so as not to observe any fill material beneath the rock. The third example illustrates a before, during, and after one winter view of an armored fill crossing. This stream is relatively large for an armored fill and has a six foot wide active channel. The crossing has been lowered approximately two and a half feet in the axis of the stream and the dump truck is placing a mix of one half foot to two foot diameter riprap in a 25 foot wide keyway. After one winter, an alluvial fan has formed on the road, but all stream flow passed over the riprap and no erosion of the underlying fill has occurred. Like rolling dips, no two armored crossings have to be constructed exactly to the same specifications. Major factors to consider include the depth of the fill at the outboard edge of the road, the size, i.e. width, and steepness of the active stream channel and the steepness of the road. These factors will dictate the final design for each armored fill crossing you construct. Now let's go over some important take-home messages. Where driving safety is not a concern, such as on straight reaches of road, road drainage is best accomplished with an outsloped road surface with or without an inboard ditch. We encourage the use of frequently spaced and properly constructed rolling dips or ditch relief culverts to disperse runoff efficiently. Size all reconstructed stream crossings for 100-year flood flows along with strong consideration for the sediment and woody debris they transport. Install culverts at the base of the fill in line with the natural grade and direction of the stream channel. Purchase adequate pipe length to build stable fill slopes over the culvert inlet and the culvert outlet. Prevent the downroad diversion of even the smallest streams by finishing your crossing with a critical dip or overflow culvert. 
If culvert plug potential is high, then utilize a flared inlet or trash rack to aid in passing sediment and wood through the pipe. Put excavated spoils to use in reshaping an outslope into the road surface or enhancing a positive or reverse grade at rolling dips. As a last resort, end haul the spoils to a flat, stable location where they will not contaminate a stream. Finally, if you anticipate winter use, rock your road surface. Apply a layer of moist gravel over the top of the road and spread evenly. This will protect the native soil surface, help maintain a smooth driving surface, and prevent an enormous amount of fine sediment production. We recommend for most roads applying an inch and a half minus. The choice is often dictated by the type of traffic using the road. While applying the rock, water the road and finish the job by using the grader for a final shaping. We have described the toll roads have taken on our soils, landscapes, fisheries, and water quality. Response by regulatory agencies to our threatened and endangered fish and sediment impaired rivers has been the TMDL. This total maximum daily load demands action from landowners to reduce the daily load of sediment pollution emanating from their lands. We offered a suite of techniques you can incorporate into your roads to reduce this controllable erosion, thus meeting the TMDL requirement. There are a zillion road miles out there eroding. We bet water coming off your roads will get cleaner as you use what you have learned here today. Spread this news to your friends and neighbors, because it will rain again. There will be a community workshop on roads and erosion at the Piercy Community Center on March 20th, Friday, beginning at 9 a.m. in the morning and running through noon, and then a field trip from 12.30 to 4 in the afternoon going up Red Mountain Road nearby. Brought to you by the Eel River Recovery Project and the Mendocino Resource Conservation District. So please consider attending. Free roads manuals available presentations by a professional geologist, and also information on how you might be able to get a grant to help upgrade and maintain your rural road system. Thanks for watching.